imagine if you can voice what you're really thinking. Now imagine an existence trapped with your inner thoughts. You know that speaking voice inside your head when you're reading a book. But worse still, you've had no one to share your thoughts with, to listen to you. Imagine you're lying in your bed, thinking, feeling, seeing, hearing, assuming your head is pointed in the right direction, but you're completely powerless to give anyone a signal that you can understand. So inside your head, you're screaming, I'm here, I'm here. But no one is listening because to everybody else, you appear to be in a completely vegetative state. Now, there are many, many different levels of consciousness. I mean, you have a coma and you have a vegetative state, which is like a coma, only with your eyes open. And then there's an unconscious state, which is where you're aware of yourself and your environment, but you're completely powerless to give any communication signal to anyone. And then there's minimally conscious. Now that's like being in some sort of twilight zone and then fully conscious. Now take Michael Schumacher, for example. You know, the Formula One race driver. He was reportedly in a vegetative state. However, upon hearing his children's voices at home, he wept silent tears. Now, I'm sorry, but that's not the behavior of a man who's in a vegetative state to me. Well, take Martin Pistorius, otherwise known as Ghost Boy. He spent 13 years locked in from a boy to a man. Except, after 10 years, his mind came back to life, but nobody knew. Nobody knew, so he was forced to endure endless reruns of Barney on TV in his wheelchair, which he hated, by the way. And worse still, he endured both verbal, physical and sexual abuse at the hands of some of his carers. Now imagine that. Imagine having to endure the sexual abuse without being able to tell anybody about it, to warn about it happening again. Horrific. And take Jimmy Fritz, the Swedish stroke survivor who also had a brainstem stroke. He recovered and went on to tell the world that he, in his bed, that the nurses and the family were at the bottom of his bed, and he actually overheard them discussing which of his organs were going to be donated to science after he died. He went on to recover. Now, Back in February 2010, at the age of 39, I was a 70 mile a week obsessive fell runner. A wife and three, had three children, worked full time, busy, busy life like all, all us mums. And suddenly I had a huge brainstem stroke and I was formally diagnosed with locked in syndrome. Now, the sciencey bit is I had a right vertical artery dissection, occlusion, and infarction of the pond. Fairly technical. What it meant was, well, to be frank, what it was like was waking up inside your own coffin. If you can imagine being so powerless, being so paralyzed, but you're feeling everything and thinking just like you are normally, but you can't move a single muscle. Horrific, frightening, anxious, overthinking. I mean, geez, I overthink anyway, but you can't help but overthink if that's all you can do all day. You can't punctuate the day with a drink or food because you're null by mouth, clearly. You're lonely, you're frightened, you've got life support, you've got no dignity at all. Um, you're frightened, thinking, what's going to happen to you? Are they going to turn the machine off? All that I'm thinking, meanwhile, my husband is being told in the very early days in ICU that I'd be better off dead. Now, I want to share with you what it's like to have that voice in your head and to be completely powerless. And I prepared something for you, which does come with a health warning, so I'm very sorry. Uh, so it might be an idea to grab some tissues, but I think it gives you an idea how I felt with that voice in my head. 
it's me, it's me, it's me, please, I'm in here, I'm in here, I'm so scared. It's that machine breathing for me. What if they think I'm not worth keeping and turn it off? I've seen the films. Where are my kids? I need to see my kids. My legs are cramping so badly. Please stop it. The hours are like days. The days are like weeks. I'm so scared and frightened. Please help me. Please, please. Now, on a lighter note, I did master the art of swearing with my eyes. You can see from that picture. But seriously, if I was to tell you that incredible scientists from Austria and Canada with Dr. Adrian Owen have developed a portable communication device that could potentially unlock the voice of unconscious patients by mapping brain activity. Pretty incredible. I can't believe it. I mean, I will never, ever forget the first time I emerged from my unconscious state. And my friends in ICU, with their own basic communication board, had asked me whether I could slightly muster up a slight blink, once for no, twice for yes, so they could finally understand what I needed, because unlike doctors, they knew I was me inside, and I wasn't released. And you know what? The very first word I spelt out, took a long time, was sleep. And it was just amazing. I can't tell you how the euphoria. It was like popping a champagne bottle of cork. It was, it was amazing. I was finally free, you know. And that night, I slept like a baby because I had sleeping pills, so it was incredible as well. But the relief for my friends to finally understand me and to communicate with me so they could understand my needs and wishes was phenomenal. So how would it work? Well, simply, you'd have a cap with electrodes and two vibrating dermal patches placed on either of the patient's wrists. One's a no patch and one's a yes patch. It's thought that the vibrating patches make it easier for the patient to attend to or focus their response to a simple yes-no question. So, for example, a patient might be asked, are they married? You can see from the top series of brain images, there's no red brain activity relating to the yes patch. However, on the lower images, you can see lots of red brain activity indicating the patient was communicating they weren't married. Indeed, they weren't. Similarly, patients were asked if they had siblings. You can see on the top series of images, there's red brain activity related to the yes patch. There isn't on the no patch. Now, this is so exciting. It's fundamentally, it's going to change lives, qualities of lives. But it won't work for everybody. I mean, you know, it has been suggested that perhaps some of the early findings in the results the full results have not been published yet, were because some of the patients were recruited onto the study, excuse me, who were minimally conscious and not unconscious. Now, given that it's estimated that between 20 and 40% of patients are misdiagnosed as vegetative, I think this is such an important development. And I, for one, am very much looking forward to the published results being made available. So, you might wonder why I think I recovered. Well, in a nutshell, the separation anxiety for my three children was phenomenal. My youngest was only five. To not be able to hug them, to not be able to tell them it's going to be okay, to console them. They read me stories, for goodness sake, talk about a role reversal. But beyond that, which was horrific and actually hurt me, it, was, it really was hard, I was written off in the first few weeks of rehab. I was expected not to recover. Their plans for me was to be written off and sent to a nursing home, dribbling in a corner somewhere in a wheelchair. And that made me really angry. I wanted to be a participatory mum with my children. They were all I had. And they'd written me off, so I was angry. So basically, I set about, the self, that, that anger gave me a self-belief to blooming well proved them wrong. And in doing so, I came up with some ridiculous, ambitious goals. I mean, I wanted to eat again. I wanted to speak again. I wanted to hug my children. I wanted to walk out of hospital, uh, run by my first anniversary, help other people who are equally as written off as me. And then I set about working really hard. And when I say really hard, 
willing my body and trying to improve any range I got any flicker back in my body, whether it was a finger or a toe or a tongue or a lips. But I did it 400 times a day, and I'm not joking. I didn't know about neuroplasticity. I didn't know about intentional medicine or visualization then. I just knew willing. I knew desperate. I knew I wanted to be back with my kids. So I did, repetitively, frequently, intensively. And do you know what? I'll give you an, idea, an example of that. I used to lie in my bed, and I'd look at my big left toe, and I'd sit staring at it, thinking, bloody move, damn you. Just move. And you know, for weeks and weeks, nothing happened. My body didn't respond. But then one day after weeks, I got the tiniest flicker. And then I tried to do it again, and it fatigued, and it wouldn't do it. So I thought I assumed I just imagined it. Anyway, I waited 10 minutes, tried it again. It worked. It was like all my Christmases had come at once. It was phenomenal. Because you know what I was thinking? Blow it up. If I can make that move, that big left toe, that being the farthest from my brain, then game on for the rest of my body. That's how I thought. I was, but I'm still very simple. Um, anyway, so how did I do with the rest of my goals? Well, I did eat again. I ate Christmas dinner. That was really impressive. It was puree. Um, I did walk out of hospital. It's on YouTube. Um, I did hug my kids again. In fact, for the first two weeks I came home, they all rotated who slept with me. But do you know what else I did? I did speak again. And I would know this, but I was never expected to speak again. And I spoke again because of my five-year-old son. You see, one Friday they came to visit me and he said to me, Mummy, don't write my name, say my name. No one even tried asking me to do it in six months. They just assumed. And I, with all my strength, I went, uh -uh. it was pretty poor, but it sounded a bit like Woody, my son's name. Now, my whole family started crying, and I'm thinking, what the hell's wrong? <laughs> and um, <laughs> I didn't think it was that bad. Anyway, so they said, say my name, say my name. So one of my children, I said, Harvey, which sounded a bit like Harvey. And Mark and India, it's like, you're having a laugh. I can't give a, can't give a laugh around that. So they went off all weekend. I practiced and practiced and practiced as obsessively as I ran. Monday morning, my favorite nurse, Oliver, came in my room with a box. And as he always did, he said, morning, Kate. And I went, morning, Oliver, not that clear. And he dropped the box, he cried, and he said, it's moments like this I came into nursing. <laughs> But also, I mean, in terms of my goal, you know, the very day I left hospital, I started writing my running free book with a ghostwriter. Just three months after I left hospital, I set up and founded Fighting Strokes, global digital media charity to inspire patients and families, pioneer research and influence stroke policy. But you know, the very best thing I did, the week before I left hospital in a wheelchair, I went to my local gym because I wanted to run again, and I thought I just needed to get fit to do that, to bring my body back to life. The gym manager was very kind. He said, you can have free gym membership, and all your family can, because we had no money. He said, but you know what? I'm going to do extra, and this is my stroke of luck. He said, I'm going to chuck in my very best physio, Mike Lee, because I do believe you'll be running again, but you need some help. I was deluded. I thought I could do it on my own. What Mike Lee didn't know and didn't understand, he found out about. And together, we were a massive force, huge team. Because within just 21 months of my brainstem stroke, this happened. <laughs> okay. Now, I think you've heard, communication really, really matters to me. In fact, I would say it's a fundamental human right. We owe it to unconscious patients to develop this technology, to give them a voice so they can be heard and their wishes respected. Because above all, this new communication technology brings new communication possibilities and hope. 